Good morning everyone. You're very, very welcome here to the main auditorium in the main campus in WIT. We are about to begin our school's choral day as part of Waterford New Music Week. And this morning we have boys and girls from WIT Music School. We have the girls from St Ursula's and we have boys from St Declan's National School, third class and sixth class. So if you are watching us live in your schools this morning, you're very, very welcome. If you're watching live from around the world, you are also very, very welcome. The children this morning have been working very, very hard preparing the theme 1916, cherishing all children equally. So the children will sing and speak in turn and I will come back halfway through to explain the second half of what the children are doing. So our first choir this morning are the WIT Music School and they are going to start the morning with an extract from Molly's Diary. It is Easter Sunday, the day the Lord has risen, and also the O'Donovan family. Up and out, bright and early, even though it is a holiday. Mother told me Jack left to go to the mountains at the crack of dawn with his pals. That's the first I've heard about a trip to the mountains. I wonder if that is true, or if there is going to be some sort of march after all. And that's his excuse. Mother and I set off at 7 o'clock with baskets of eggs, for some of the families in the slums around us. The blind basket markers up the road had given us some dear little baskets, which we had decorated with ribbons and we had painted the boiled eggs. We didn't have time for breakfast, so my mother gave me a sticky bun as a special treat from the Dublin Bread Company. I ate half and put the other half in my hanky, in my pocket, beside my tin of humbugs. After Mass, Father and I accompanied Mother to Amiens Street Station. When we got back home, there were several messages for Father to go straight to the GPO to run some maintenance checks. Our own telephone line wasn't working either, so he sent one of his boys to fetch Mrs Nugent to mind me and left straight away. But she sent a message that she had a headache, even though she had promised my mother she would be on hand to help out if emergency arose. My father had already gone out and I was on my own, not that I minded. I looked out the window and saw Jack's shadow, Hyacinth, pretending to window shop in Dunn's Hatters. Since it was Easter, I felt sorry for her wasting her time. Jack's gone to the mountains since the crack of dawn, I called out the window. I've just seen him go down by the keys with Anto, she said, saucy as you please. So, he was lying about the mountains. Since father has already gone out and Miss Nugent isn't here, I'm going to look for Jack with his new friends at Liberty Hall. This is being a bit daring. I don't normally go far afield on my own without Jack or my parents, but I really must find out what is going on, and I'm a big girl now.
Easter Monday, 24th of April, 1916. I was free. Hurrah. I decided to crawl out onto the roof. I took Father's spyglass with me. It is brass and leather and extends out in four sections to just over a foot and a half. It helps you see stuff miles away as if it's under your nose. As I looked down Abbey Street, I saw marchers from Liberty Hall and strained to see if Jack might be among them. I saw Matthew Connolly, the bugler, at the front sounding the fall in as a group, including his brother, Sean the actor, headed over Butt Bridge by the Customs House. They were quite a raggle-taggle army of about 60. I spotted the leader, James Connolly, in his dark green uniform with the gun with the bayonet. On his right, Patrick Pierce, the teacher with his large pale face and the darker green of the volunteer. Beside him, the man who looks half dead, Joseph Plunkett, the camp son, with a bandage around his foot. He was beautifully dressed in high tan leather boots with spurs and more prints, says Ivy. They were marching together just like in Anto's pose. Some of the small army were in green uniforms, but many had made up their uniform as if for a play. Some had no uniforms, just armbands. As I gazed at the marshes and thought how sad it was that so many people wanted to fight each other, I felt guilty for the frightening poor old nosy Nugent. I vowed to make an apology, so I raced downstairs to take her embroidery to the Metropo Hotel across the street from where she boards. I noticed that my father had left behind his sandwiches as he was in such a rush for a meeting with the post office head, Mr. Hamilton Norway. I decided to take them to Father as the GPO is just beside the Metropo. After that, I knew I would have a boring day doing Latin as penance.
I bolted into the main entrance of the GPO and inquired after my father. One of the counter staff said he might have left, left with Mr. Hamilton Norway, who had an urgent meeting at the castle. But another said he might still be in the instrument room, as there were a few problems with the wires. I joked with the clerk that some people have nothing better to do than buy stamps on a holiday. I was one of them. I quickly perched a postcard and stamp for my mother and wrote a brief message saying how much I missed her. The clerk was unsuring me towards the lift when the marchers from outside suddenly surged in. Several people looked with amusement as if it was a joke or some kind of game. The woman in front of me, a large lady in a colourful hat, sighed in annoyance. I'm sorry, but my daughter is getting married in six weeks and these are our wedding invitations, she insisted. I'm not leaving here without my stamps. She got the message when the rebel poked her gently in the back with his pike. When the clerk vaulted over the corner and ran for the door, that was like a signal. A sudden understanding swept through the room and it was Bella, Bedlam. People rushed towards the main doors, frenzy, coats flying, bodies bumping into each other. There was so much turmoil that some of the rebels were nearly pushed out of the doors themselves. I got the impression that some of them didn't realize themselves what was going on. At first it was comical, but then fear gripped me like ice in my veins. I felt my legs glued to the floor by the counter.
Still shaking, I looked out the window and saw the rebels distributing pamphlets to astonished onlookers. <coughs> I wondered if it was the same notice I saw little Rosie Hackett running in with yesterday at Liberty Hall. A proclamation, whatever that is. One of them is going to read something, I called out. It's Patrick Pierce. Everything stopped in the instrument room. He gazed down below at Patrick Pierce, surrounded by broken glass. He held the paper in his hand and twitched with nerves, but he read out his proclamation in a clear voice. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations, there are a few shouts of hear, hear. Then one person called traitor. Let the man speak, called out the flower sower at Nelson's pillar. We hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign, independent state, and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom. Several people walked off, but the flower seller was weeping. The, rep the Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens, cherishing all the children of the nation equally. Thanks,
just while the boys from St. Declan's National School are just making their way back to the seats, I will just explain the second half of our morning. The children over the last few weeks have been preparing their own proclamations. So what is relevant to children in Waterford and in Ireland today in 2016? So they've had interesting discussions, I know, in their classrooms and at their rehearsals of what they think is important to them and what is important to the country as we celebrate 1916 today. So our first proclamation is going to come from the WIT Music School and in between all of those proclamations from each of the schools we will hear a song of friendship and peace. So please welcome our readers from WIT Music School. There should be home for the homeless and food for everybody. We should only have two days off, two days of work and five days off. Teacher, teachers should wear uniforms and children should be able to wear whatever they want in school. Kids should be allowed to play the lotto and when we do, we should always win. There should be no cruelty to animals. Every school should have a bouncy castle. Children should be allowed to vote and to be voted for. We should always sit down when singing. We should all give to charity, share and be more helpful. We should have no homework ever again, but if we do, we should be paid to do it. Everyone should have a necklace and when you throw it against a wall, a unicorn comes out of it.
like to welcome the girls from St. Ursula's to read their proclamations. Proclamation. A friendly school, that's our rule. To play together is really cool. Working together, feeling strong. This is a country where I belong. Home and school, keep them clean. This is what it means to be green. Celebrating life as we go along. Feels even better singing a song. We will now have St. Declan's Boys National School to read their proclamation. <coughs> we want to address the Government of Ireland to help improve the health of all Irish people and especially the children living in this country. We feel that cigarettes should be much more expensive to stop young people from smoking. Young people should meet with people who have health problems because of smoking, and then they will realize how harmful it is. We also feel there should be more tax on sweets and junk food, and that healthier foods, like fruit, should be much cheaper. This will encourage people to make healthier food choices. We would like to see a healthier and fitter Ireland going forward.
Good morning, boys and girls. We hope you've all had a great morning singing. We're now all going to join together in We Are The World by Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie. Please welcome our friends from City of Waterford Brass. And our friends from Theatre Box.
boys and girls, we've come to the end of our mornings singing. First of all, I would like to thank you all. So could I please thank the WIT Music School boys and girls. Let's give us a wave, guys. <laughs> to all of the girls in third class in St. Ursula's. <laughs> to the boys of sixth class in St. Eklund's. To the boys of third class in St. Eklund's. It leaves me to absolutely congratulate you all on all of your hard work. We started working on this after Christmas and it's been hard, hard work, but I hope you've had absolute brilliant fun preparing for it. And I know my colleagues preparing the children in the WIT Music School, Valerie and Geraldine are here this morning. And I have to say, I've absolutely loved every single minute I've had in your schools since Christmas. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really don't know what I'm going to do now from next week, but I'm sure there's something I can do or I'll find to do somewhere. But I do have some thank yous, so do please bear with me for a minute. I would like to thank my colleagues in the WIT Music School, Geraldine and Valerie are here. I would like to thank... I would like to thank all of the teachers who left me into your classrooms for the last three months, the teachers in St. Declan's and St. Urs Ursula's. I would also like to thank our WIT president, Professor Willie Donnelly, who was here earlier this morning to meet and greet the children. I would like to thank Kean and all the technical staff up there in the Crow's Nest. So Kean, thank you very much. I would also like to thank the WIT porters and technical staff in the Estates Office for their help and support. I promise now I have only one or two more. I would also sincerely like to thank my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Hazel Farrell in the Department of Creative and Performing Arts, who was great help in putting this together as well this morning. Thank you, Hazel. And I would also like to thank John, one of our fourth year degree students who came along and assisted as well this morning. Thank you, John. And last thank you goes to um, my own friends in City of Waterford Brass and in Theatre Box for helping us make the recording of We Are The World. So thank you to them. So I, th I think there's one person that hasn't been thanked at all who has done a huge amount of work and who has coordinated this whole event. Who do you think I'm talking about? Julie! So a huge thank you to Julie. Julie is an absolutely wonderful person who gives up her own time very, very um, thanklessly. She comes out into all the schools with E and works really, really hard and does all of her other work as well. And she coordinates these very, very beautiful events. And we're all very, very grateful to Julie. So thanks again to Julie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>